speak as loudly as I can. Um, I never grew up playing a lot of sports, uh, mostly because, what? oh yes, the kids are going to go out, uh, if there's kids in here or people that want to be kids, you're welcome to go out if you want. Um, while they're going out, um, the only sport that I actually did to play uh, for only two years was, was basketball just because it was a lot cheaper, and uh, the first year was just kind of on an inner school thing, and so I think there was, you know, like one game with somebody at the end of the year to, to say whether there's a championship or not. The second year, I, I played on high school um, team, and it was the whole deal. I mean, you, you get to go to all the different tournaments and all the whole thing, and um, in the end, um, they were really good, so I got to watch them be really good. They threw me out once in a while, you know, when they weren't afraid they were going to lose the game at all, and uh, uh, I watched them win a championship. And I was trying to think back to a time when I felt like a victor. And I think that's probably the closest at that championship where I ever felt like like I was a champion, so to speak. And and yeah, I know that we have a baptism coming up, and, and I know that the chairs are hard, they're not like the ones at church. But this morning, I, I do want to take a few minutes to talk about victory for, for just a few moments. Um, because today is Easter. In fact, the, the truth is, today you are victors. And I think we should talk about that for a moment. And, and so I want to look at a scripture this morning that talks about victory. If you have your Bibles, it's in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, it's a letter that was written by a guy named Paul to another guy named Timothy, a younger leader in the church. And, and the whole scripture really is all about uh, being victorious, or, or, or being a victor, or being a champion. Um, and in, in, in this scripture, I, what I want to do is I want to read this and then kind of go back and look at it quickly this morning. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing, which by the way, you understand what he's talking about that, right? And his, in view of his appearing means he's alive. That's, it's talking about Easter here, right? This is an Easter passage. This is in view of his appearing... And his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrines. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. But, uh, sorry, they will turn their ears away and from truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. But now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Then just to almost say, hey, listen, don't forget that this isn't for you, too. He says this, and not only for me, but all of those who have longed for his appearing. And here's what I want you to capture in the scripture that I just read. There are two types. I, I want to suggest that there are two types of victory that he refers to in this particular passage. There is the victory in Jesus that we have today. And then there is the victory in Jesus that we will know tomorrow. Now. I know that some people just kind of put, kind of blend all these things together. It's going to be distracting for some of you to have kids out there playing. Well, it's the car alarm. Going on. Oh, car alarm's going off? <laughs> it's okay. No. Um, anyway, um, some people do all kinds of different things with those. Some people kind of blend them all together. There's some that just talk about one type of victory and forget about the other. Uh, but what I want to do today is, is talk about both for, for just a couple of minutes, and here's the reason why. If there's anything that Easter should remind us of, it's that we have victory in Jesus both now and forever. Somebody should say amen to that part, right? We have victory now and forever. Now, the first of the categories that I want to talk about is the easiest for me to talk about, but it's the second one that I mentioned there just a moment ago. Easter's... Sunday should remind us of a victory in Jesus that means that we win the war. And, and I know that I don't, I don't personally like that kind of language when you kind of talk about uh, war and all that. 
And yet at the same time, I, I got to tell you this morning that I am so looking forward to someday standing before Jesus and meeting him someday face to face. I mean, I, I just have to tell you this morning, I believe that because I, 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 I believe in Jesus and, and he died for me on the cross and all that stuff that Pastor Natalie talked about and, and Mary who happened to come and, and share with us this morning. Yes. Um, because of all that stuff, I believe that there will be a day that, that waits me when I will get a chance to go and spend time in the presence of God himself. In fact, Revelation tells me that in that place, it is a place where there will be no more pain or sorrow, and every tear will be wiped away, and, and there will be no more conflict or war or sin. And that in that place, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and, and all the things that are twisted and broken that we know will be made right. In fact, truthfully, I, I don't know about you, but when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the term good. And I think we have a definition for the term good in our lives, but, but the truth is, I think that, that word good will be redefined the moment we meet Jesus and we spend time with him in heaven. The reason why is because the ultimate victory belongs to Jesus. You see, the moment he stepped out of the grave, he defeated sin and death. And if you are his, ultimate victory also belongs to you today. That's why they call him Messiah. That's why they call him Savior. That's why they call him the Prince of Peace. He is our advocate before the Father and wins heaven on behalf of you and me. Paul talks about this at the end of the passage that we just read just a few moments ago. He is looking at his life and he's realizing that it's coming to an end, that it's winding down and that it's almost done. And there's no fear or hesitation in what he says here. In fact, what he declares most boldly, in fact, is I have finished the race, right? I have fought the good fight and I have kept the faith. Then he starts talking about the crown that awaits him. The type that follows all who trust in Jesus. And you know, I, I look forward to standing before Jesus someday, not because I'm good enough or have ever been good enough, but because you see that day, he won my heart when he won over the grave that could not hold me. And I win because he paid the price for me. And you win because he paid the price for you. We win because Jesus won. And an empty tomb this morning is our rally cry. And it's for that reason People have been singing these songs that we sung this morning about heaven someday and about meeting Jesus someday and about moving on from this place for years because there's victory in Jesus. For the war is won. For the follower of Jesus, this place is supposed to be just a temporary home. Our home belongs to Him. Yet victory in a conversation can't end there. In fact, it cannot stop there. It, as good as that conversation is, as, as much as some of us long or we ought to long for the day when we'll go to be with Jesus, oh, there, there have been some who have stopped there. Don't get me wrong. I remember studying in, in college about some groups who thought that Jesus was going to come back tomorrow, literally, and so they would lock themselves in a room uh, to, to death waiting for Jesus to come because they just wanted him to come. There are people throughout history who, who are examples of people who threw themselves at death so that they could skip over the earth part and go to be with Jesus. And you know, I, this may sound wrong this morning, but I, I can kind of sympathize with that. Because if you really understand what heaven's all about, we ought to long and groan after the day when we will be with him. Because it's going to be so much better than here. And yet, the problem that I have with that is that their hope is misplaced. And the reason why is because there is victory in Jesus. He has won the war. But the war, dear friends, is not over. You know what's interesting as, as a person who loves to play uh, board games and that kind of thing? Um, I love strategy games. One of the classics, chess, if, if you look at some of these great chess players, what's interesting about them is that most of them can, can see out in front of their moves several moves ahead. They, they know the different possibilities of what people can do. And so imagine this for a moment with me. You could see victory before it comes five or six moves out ahead of actually winning. But catch this, you still have to 
finish those five or six moves to finish the game. And this is where the second piece of, uh, of, of victory news comes in good this morning. There is victory in Jesus, not just for tomorrow, but there is victory in Jesus today. In fact, if you look at verses 68, Paul talks about his end game, about how his journey is kind of coming to an end, about what, what he thinks he's, is waiting for him uh, when he gets to heaven. But if you look at verses 1 to 6, the bulk of this scripture, what it is is, is him claiming victory in, in his life up to this point. There's a sense in which he's almost kind of reflecting and looking at over his life and looking at the things that, that he has won in. These are the things that he says, nobody could take away from me. And when he looks at these things, you will find literally Paul spends his time in these things to the day he dies. And these three things, I believe, are things that he calls us to today, too. You and me. And he calls Timothy to in this particular passage. Three things that, that nothing on earth can stop. Three things that we can claim victory over this very day because of Jesus. Number one is this. He tells him to preach the gospel and do it in season and out of season. And just before you think that that's kind of a preacher thing and that doesn't apply to you and kind of check out this morning, I actually looked at the, the, the deep translation behind this and, and what's interesting is, is that the ERV translates it this way, tell everyone about God's message. That's as much your responsibility as it is mine. Do you catch that? And in fact, I want you to, to see this. Well, part of the reason why I believe that Paul said this to Timothy that morning was this, that nobody can crush what Jesus has done in your life. In fact, if, if you want to take a great example of this, look at Paul and what you will find in his life is somebody who, who they put in prison, but he's still saying to Jesus. They, they, they told him not to speak about Jesus, and they beat him up, and he crawled away and told more people about Jesus. They gave him people that, that didn't want to listen to what he had to say about Jesus. And he found a way to tell them about Jesus. Right? I mean, he's a, a great example of this. Why? Because it was real for Paul. God had woken him up. And that was something that, that beating couldn't take away from him. It was something that prison couldn't take away from him. You, you can't crush that kind of thing. And listen to me. When Jesus comes into your life and he wakes you up, that is something that no one can take away from you. I, I bet... Maybe there's somebody in this room that needed to hear that today. I was thinking about it, and I couldn't help but realize that maybe there's somebody in this place that you've been made fun of a lot, or maybe you've been finding it tough to live out your Christian relationship today. I don't know what that looks like, but God doesn't give messages like this by mistake. Listen to me, friend. Victory is yours, because that, what God has done in your life, is something that nobody can take away from you. Then there's number two. Two is just as exciting. He goes on to say this, correct, rebuke, and encourage. And he says, and you need to catch this because this part is important. He says, do it with patience and careful instruction. The reason why is because what comes in verse three and four, he says people basically are fickle. They, they go after what they want to hear, right? We're like that sometimes, aren't we? Didn't hear any amens to that one. That's kind of interesting why we didn't say amen to that one. But, but you know, we tend to go against the, after the local, local trends, don't we? Whether it's good or bad. Yet I want you to imagine this this morning and realize that this is actually uh, just something you can imagine, but this is actually true. You are the voice of reason that God wants to call people back to him. You are the voice of reason that God wants to use to call people back back to him. And the truth is, there is nothing more stable to stand on than truth. Let me illustrate this for you this morning. My shoes are black. They're black. That's true. Now, you can deny that. You can avoid talking about that with me. You, you can even curse me in my shoes to try to get me out of your face about whether my shoes are black or not. You can even paint them a different color. Yet underneath, they will still remain black. That is true. And I can stand on it, get it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, little joke. You may be somebody who needs to hear this this morning. Loving people around you. Offering them truth. Patiently and carefully and consistently. 
That is not easy to do within this world. It, it, it is not always something that will make you popular. It is not always something that will be free. Sometimes it will cost you. And yet at the same time, it is something that no one can take from you. It is something that no one can destroy. It is something that no one can paint over. The truth is that Jesus set us the bar on this one. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, yet look what he did for us in the midst of our sin. And if that weren't enough, the entire time he pointed unwaveringly to truth and never once stopped loving us. I mean, if you were a follower of Jesus today, you know how much that has changed your life this morning, don't you? Which brings me to the final one this morning. He gives a third set of instructions here to Timothy, and, and they go like this. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge your duties of your ministry. And this morning, I want you to understand that no one, no one can crush what God has done in your life. No one can touch you when you stand consistently on love and truth and love the people around you just the same way that God loves them. But finally, I need to say this this morning. Faithfulness wins Every time. Faithfulness wins every time. Faith, and you've heard this definition before, faith is the evidence of things unseen. But the challenge with faith in our lives is the trust part, isn't it? I mean, it's the heart of what faith is all about, but it, it is the most difficult part of that whole faith thing because faith is not faith if you can see the outcome. It becomes something else then. You're just following what you see. What real faith is, is, is going even when you can't see. In fact, what Jesus taught us, maybe even more important than any of the other lessons that he taught us the moment that he stepped out of the grave, is that what he will do, he will do. Because he said he would. A person that puts their head down and trusts in God. Not with their eyes that they can see, but with their heart who has chosen to follow regardless of whether they can see or not. You will find that person still hanging on when everybody else has fallen away. You will find that person accomplished in their faith and in their life with God. For they have been following when everybody else has been wavering around and trying to figure out what to do. You will find that person not always knowing where they're going or what it's going to look like, but trusting their Lord and Savior because He is their Lord and Savior. They are faithful. It's very difficult to do anything with somebody who's just faithful. It's irrational, right? And it consistently moves a person forward. Can I ask you today, are you faithful? Are you moving forward even when you can't see it? I suspect that maybe there's somebody here who needed to hear this today. That there is victory in faithfulness. Do not grow weary in, in, in doing good. Have you heard that scripture before? Yeah. I know that maybe some of you today are weary. You just want to see what's next. You long to see what's next. But don't forget that you can trust in your Savior. You know, there will be a day when this journey is done and you can rest in His presence. Until then, there is nothing that can stop the faithful follow. Of Jesus. You know, I, I find the word victory kind of a strange one. I've never known war in my lifetime, so I, I think it's a bit of a war term, and I think maybe that's why it kind of bothers me a bit. I tried to several times this week exchange the word victory for win, but the problem with the word win is, is that wins come and go. The thing about victory is, is that it says what the outcome is is known. Somewhere in the range of about 2,000 years ago, there was a man by the name of Jesus who was severely beaten, whipped, and pierced, and then killed on a cross. His body laid in a grave, and he was no more, except three days later, he stepped out of the tomb. And he conquered sin and death and opened up a whole new world for those who believe. This morning, he has given you victory. 
Yeah, that means that we'll get to go to heaven someday. And don't get me wrong, I'm looking forward to that day. But it also means that there's victory for you right here and now. Would you close your eyes with me this morning for just a moment? To kind of finish this particular time before we move into our baptism service. I want to invite you to kind of quiet your hearts before God this morning. There's been so much activity over this past week, at least in my life. I don't know about you, but Easter weekend seems like a crazy weekend. Such a good service on, on a Friday, those of you who were able to make it. Well over 600 people. It was incredible to worship with our brothers and sisters. Would you take a minute this morning and just thank God for sending his son to you today? And while you're doing it, while you're praying, I don't want to interrupt that, but I just I need to say this in the background. Would you just stop while you're praying that and just kind of take it in that, that Jesus, the Son of God, died for you to buy your pardon. <coughs> and again, while you're praying, there's one last thing that I want to ask you to do this morning. Would you join me in praising him today that the story did not end with the two? <coughs> <coughs> say one more thing this morning. Maybe there's somebody this morning in this place and you need victory in your life. Oh friend, I, I don't mind talking to you. I'd love to talk to you, but li listen to me this morning. Don't ask me for victory. I can give no one victory, but Jesus can give you victory this morning. Whatever that looks like. I ask that you would just kind of ask that of him. Father God, we thank you for a chance to just take a few minutes to stop and kind of consider this whole topic of victory. It doesn't take very long, at least for me anyway, to look into my own life and realize there's some places that I want to know your victory. And in the same breath, that there are so many places that you have shown me victory. Not that I deserve, oh, but that was freely given by you. God, I thank you for making us victorious this morning because you stepped out of that grave and taught us what life is. 2,000 years later, we sit in this place knowing you, knowing the Father because of that day. We praise you for that day. We give you thanks, Nick.